ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Soleri Report. This is a special report and a special treat because I am finally able to uh, interview a colleague and new friend that uh, I can't tell you how, uh, how much you're going to learn today. I don't need to tell you that we will just do it. I want to introduce Carl von Wolfren, who is... A journalist, a publisher, a author, a professor here in the Netherlands. He is known for his incredible work on Japanese society, a very famous book, The Enigma of Japanese Power. I brought my copy with me. Um, and he, uh, he thought he was going to enjoy uh, a quieter period in his life, but COVID hit, so he started a new magazine, right? And um, author of many books, but somebody who I've come to really value his opinion. And I've been sitting here as we've waited to start the interview and I'm just, it's one question after another. <laughs> I hate people who do it to me, but I always do it to you. So Carl, welcome to the Soleri Report and thank you so much for inviting us into your beautiful library and home to do well, this Thank interview. you for, for doing this. Of course, I'm very interested in what you write and I've been following you and I think that uh, we are a little mutual admiration uh, <laughs> clique. <here. laughs> I know, but you have a, a much greater depth of knowledge historically, particularly of Europe and Asia than I do. So I'm, you know, I'm an investment banker. I can't match what you know about the financial world. Right. And, uh, and so uh, I think we, we balance out. Well. Okay. Okay. Well, so something has happened. We have a Russian invasion of the Ukraine. You have a lot of understanding of the Ukraine, of NATO. Let's just dive in. And if you could talk a little bit about the history of the Ukraine, particularly from the, the events in 2014 forward. Take yeah. it whichever way you want, but let's, let's talk a, a little bit. What's the historical context of what's happening right. today? Well, 2014 was obviously uh, very important because we had a coup. Uh, it was a coup. Uh, the uh, Western pundits, uh, commentators, historians keep on talking about a, um, uh, a folk, re a revolution that uh, started with students, the usual suspects. And, uh, and they were, in fact, they started in, uh, in the months before, in the, in the winter uh, of 2013 with grievances that were legitimate, etc. So that's how things began. But it was a coup that was, uh, George Soros played a major role. It's the right. NGOs of Soros and the NGOs of the National Endowment of Democracy, right. uh, which of course is a congressional thing. And during the Cold War, the NED would uh, help uh, dissent in uh, the communist countries pay them for mimeograph machines for their Sami's dot literature and things like that. And uh, Carl Gershman, who uh, ran the show then, I knew him personally, I met him a few times, and I, you know, as far as I could tell, this was a genuine effort. But then the, the wall fell, uh, the Soviet Union disappeared, this, <clears throat> of course, soon thereafter. And there was absolutely no need for the National Endowment of Democracy to continue <laughs> working. but. Like with those, so, so, if, so very often with those things, they an never know how to die. <laughs> it works, and then they continued to uh, to exist in order to help influence things uh, to go the way that Washington uh, wanted. Uh, <clears throat> and I think Soros played probably the more important role. But yet Victoria Nuland, uh, who uh, was the uh, the Under Secretary of something or other. And uh, uh, and she uh, boasted once that you know they spent five billion dollars to uh, to get this far to get this uh, coup. Didn't call it a coup, but uh, that's what it was. Uh, that of course changed the Ukraine from a relatively sovereign country into a country controlled, remote controlled by Washington. 
and in a more direct fashion controlled by the CIA for, you know, for detailed operations, mm -hmm. false flags and what have you. M MH17 is an example and many other examples. I don't think anything important happened in Ukraine without either the consent or the orders of uh, uh, the, the, the CIA and Washington a little bit farther away. One of the things that really I find very noticeable about the Ukraine is if you look at where Eastern Europe was economically when the wall came down, so 89 to 91, Poland has dramatically increased its per capita income. Russia has dramatically increased its per capita income. The Ukraine has never increased its per capita income. In fact, if you look last year, it dropped. It was yeah, fourteen. It's choking, it's choking with oligarchs who enriched themselves, as happened in Yeltsin's time. You know, in in uh, in the Russian right, Federation. Right, but, but it's a society whose destruction is defined by organized crime. Yes, absolutely. And it's absolutely, you know, my concern because Chernobyl happened in the Ukraine before the wall came down. Right. You know, a society can only implode so far before very dangerous things start to happen. Right. And you're really looking, if you look at the poverty in the Ukraine, it's absolutely um, phenomenal that a society that is that intelligent and has, you know, the kind of skills or education that the Ukrainians or resources as the breadbasket, yeah. that, that such a society could fall that to such a, a degree of debasement. Mm -hmm. It's very shocking to me. Yeah, it is shocking. But, you know, any society that's, uh, how shall we call it, that, is an, uh, that suffers from a, uh, a criminal, uh, cr criminal networks. Yes. But our last two years, Europe, maybe more than the US in a, in a little bit in a different way. And of course, the uh, countries like Aus Australia and New Zealand and Canada, the, <coughs> the five ice countries, suffer from a crime syndicate that right. has, you know, that has been trying to establish a totalitarian system, a supranational totalitarian system with the World Economic Forum as an important coordinating, uh, uh, organizing center. And it's a crime syndicate. Right. It's, a, uh, it's something that is going to create, or they're trying to, going to create um, in the long run, uh, a slave society. So it's interesting. <clears throat> the Russians have been very clear for over a decade. They watched what happened in Libya they watched what happened in Syria. You know, I remember as a child reading about the conquests of the Roman Empire and being taught that the Roman Empire brought infrastructure, they brought education, they brought roads, they brought bridges, they brought water systems. When you watch Charlie Ferguson's documentary on Iraq, what you realize is the neocons, and this I associate these... Uh, Terry Musson calls them the Straussians. Yeah. But the neocons, they bring chaos. They bring the end of civilization. And they bring institutional organized crime that absolutely destroys civilization. It destroys people. It destroys civic infrastructure. It destroys culture. They're like a whirling dervish of, yeah, yeah, yeah. of demonic force. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, well, and it's... it's, it's it goes beyond our ability to imagine things. It, it's, it's above, it's, it's beyond our... So I have to disagree with you there because I worked with them in Washington and I can't imagine them. <laughs> but the scale. Right. Well, the, you know, it was clear they were looking to get the bit in their teeth and if they got it, they would do any scale you can imagine. They would do the whole planet. This is if, global. Right. That's, that's I mean... Okay, I think that uh, if we want to go back to this, I think that uh, Kennedy's book, Robert, Robert uh, Kennedy Jr. book on uh, Fauci is very enlightening. Yeah. Uh, and I think the most important uh, page in that book is when uh, Gates 
uh, invites Fauci to his library when they have a meeting of uh, people from around the world uh, studying TB. And, uh, and he takes Fauci to his library and he says to Fauci, uh, you uh, supervise the biggest health organization in the US, but also in the world, uh, infectious diseases uh, thing. Why don't we team up? Why don't we uh, work together? And, and he says that in so many words. So we can, we can inject the world's population regularly with whatever the pharma uh, people come up with. And of course, we know he has uh, right. uh, lots of, lots of uh, interest in the pharma, etc. And there is where it starts. So what we have with the COVID thing, what we experienced was these two men, criminals, I can only think of them as criminals. Right. These two men, uh, one of them has already taken control of the WHO, uh, is able, they are able to, uh, to control the world in a way that it has never been controlled before on that global scale. They have, they're able to make a large percentage of the world's population acts as, as idiots with masks, uh, 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 with obedience masks, as we call them with our magazine. Uh, <clears throat> the financial people weren't yet at that time in a, a position where they were after 2008 with the credit crisis. The credit crisis is eight years after Fauci and Gates met. Right. And of course, not immediately after the credit crisis, but after a little while, they realized that the system, the financial system that they had uh, nursed, they, it couldn't continue. It was, it was sort of reaching a, uh, so a I, dire... I'm <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I'm going to back you up and on that one. That was, and then they joined the crime syndicate. Now, I, 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 I want to. Uh, this is how I see it. It's not one monster. It's not a multi-headed monster. There are little monsters side by side, and they have decided that it's to their advantage to to establish what they want to achieve uh, in different ways. Uh, using this crisis. Yeah, but Ga Gates and Fauci are both on a payroll. And if you look at what happened in 1995, the establishment tried to broker a budget deal and it failed. And they made a decision as a group that said, we give up on this structure of government, it won't work. And that's when the financial coup started. And in fact, what the largest pension fund investor in the country said, the president of Cowper said, he said, They've given up on the country. They're moving all the money out. And that, that deal busted in October 95. The next month, the predatory lending kicked off yeah. and the FDA approved OxyContin, the opioids. And the reason why was at that point, the only way you could then balance the budget, if you couldn't get the financial deal, the only way you could balance the budget was to bring down the life expectancy. Right. And the reason, so that's when the 21 trillion started to go missing. Yeah. And the reason every year I kept pounding the drum about the missing money was because I knew the only way they could balance the books, given that they were stealing all the money, I mean, they're levering the governments up and they're taking all the money out the back door. They had to bring down the life expectancy. It had to end in COVID-19. Right. There was no, it's math. And so, um, well, so, you, I mean, so, you, you so know, what, uh, yeah, you know about uh, quite a few, uh, what, what probably are my blind spots. No, but so here, here, uh, in the United States in 1996, a process started that I call the Great Poisoning, mm -hmm. that Fauci was very much a part of. Right. And then Gates came in, and but the Great Poisoning had started at November 1995. And it just kept growing and then they piled in, but they, they came into that wave that had been decided by the central bankers in October, 
I think that uh, I need to sit down with you. <laughs> time That's what we're doing. And get no, my <laughs> and get <laughs> and get more details. My uh, you see, my knowledge there it obviously uh, is uh, very limited. So I see. I see. What I see is what happens after two thousand. And I think also it's necessary that it's after 2000 because it's from then on that we have not just a so-called narrative about things, but mm -hmm. a prescribed reality. And that is after the 9-11 uh, right. crime. Uh, the difference is that narratives are as old as, uh, you know, it go, they go back to Babylonia or somewhere. Uh, probably. Governments have uh, very frequently in history uh, tried to, uh, to deceive their uh, populations and sometimes very successfully so. Uh, those are narratives. So and you could, you could go against them and that was sometimes risky. But the difference between a narrative and a prescribed reality is what we got in 2000, is that if you don't publicly adhere to it, you lose a large part of your circle of acquaintances. You may even have to deal with a breakup in your marriage. No, I'm not joking. Oh, this no, I know all about you, it. If you are a journalist, you certainly uh, lose your income. Uh, even if you are a, a professor at a university nowadays, you definitely lose your position. Right. That is the prescribed reality. And you don't need to believe it. It's, it's comparable to, uh, to say, uh, the Soviet Union. In, in, the time, in the early time, you had to believe all the nonsense that you were told <laughs> about, you know, Marxist-Leninism, etc. Now if you but just carried it. But gradually, you didn't need to believe it as long as you obeyed. It is about obedience. It right. is about the establishment of a slave society. That's what it comes down to. Right. So, but that's the difference between the narrative and the prescribed reality. Yeah. And what you describe is still in a time of a narrative. Right. And the, the, and there was still possible for for different people to dig into it, and they wouldn't necessarily break up their marriages by doing so. And now they will right. if they uh, publicly. If they privately, of course, they can, uh, like we are doing, we, we have, uh, there are many other people like that. So this, I, is, this is a big difference. It's a huge difference. I want to come back around to 9-11, but first I want to go back in time. Because when the United States, when World War II ended, the United States left an occupying army in Japan and Germany. But it was all under the rubric and the umbrella of this organization called NATO which a lot of Americans didn't know about until Trump came along and said, we ought to shut it down. <laughs> so you have a very deep understanding of NATO and NATO plays into what's going on in the Ukraine. So oh, maybe, because yeah. I want to weave these different- But that's a not, that is not the NATO uh, that existed when it started and that, right. that, that, you know, that existed more or less up to the disintegration of the Soviet Union. So uh, that was a different NATO. It's set up specifically as a defensive organization. Right. It would not do anything uh, in an offensive way. And that only began with the bombing of uh, Belgrado and the, in the Kosovo war, of course. And since then, there have been actively offensive uh, uh, in, uh, in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And of course, they have destroyed Libya, reinstated the slave markets there. It is all right. terrible. The, the important thing about NATO is that uh, it's not accountable uh, to any uh, entity in Europe. It's supposed to be a European, a transatlantic uh, organization, but the Europeans have no say over it. That is significant. It is. Uh, it is in the hands of whoever is in charge at a particular time in Washington. Right. And it can be used for all manner of purposes that the pe per person who is in charge in Washington wants to use it for. Europeans have, have no leverage over it. And if they wanted to stop it, they, couldn't, they wouldn't know how to start. But it has had a very important effect on European intellectual life, 
I mean, the, the European intellectuals are, as it were, uh, live in a cage where they offer. It's a no, maybe not. A it's cage, a huge it's, budget. It's a kindergarten. It's kindergarten uh, in which the geopolitical uh, developments are described uh, like in a comic book. Right. With with uh, with with <laughs> with baddies and with. Uh, it's unbelievable how simplistic it all is, and that has also made it impossible for. Uh, for literate Europeans, for, for people who normally would, uh, would be critical of developments and would be able to follow the geopolitical developments, they're not capable of doing so. And they can't, of course, no, none of the member states of the European Union, at the same time the member states of, the, of NATO, can have their own foreign policy. Right. And the European Union cannot possibly have a foreign policy. So if people ask, what are you about? Uh, very often, of course, uh, you know what an entity is about if you can study the, its face towards the rest of the world. That you are about what you show in your face. But European Union has no face to the world. It's, it's uh, you know, it's uh, uh, in, uh, in, in use by the NATO. So the for one of the first times, this is a, just a tangent, one of the first times I ever noticed NATO was a Dutch auditor who'd been appointed, I guess people take turns being the auditor, a Dutch auditor announced that there was 500, was it 500 million or 500, but some huge amount of money missing from the NATO accounts. Yeah. <laughs> I said, oh, they're doing it in Europe too. Okay. So, um, so let's go back to 9-11. Right after 9-11, yeah. George W. Bush... And the neocons start all of this yep. by canceling the missile treaty. Yep. And from then on, we see conversation and discussion in the U.S. intelligence and military community about creating first strike ca capacity right. against Russia, yep. bringing Russia to heel, yep. and and steadily moving east to encroach on Russia, which has been going on since two thousand two. Yeah. So this is now 20 years. Yeah. So take us back there. Why did the Bushies decide to destroy the world this way? It's interesting. They, of course, the, uh, uh, the war on terror uh, was a, um, uh, a PSYOP. Right. They, uh, a lot of what has overcome Europe uh, and, and the Netherlands included, of course, is uh, you know is is due to uh, various psyops that were uh, that grew out of the techniques that were already in use by uh, the CIA, but that were highly developed in that uh, period of the war on terror. Right, and uh, it's I've, I mean there's several ways of of explaining this. It's the necessity economic necessity of having a Keynesian engine running underneath the American economy, and that is the, mil min the uh, military industrial complex. It's important to note, many people uh, do not realize, is that uh, Russia doesn't have a military industrial complex. It has a defense system and a defense industry that is pinpointed to making the right things. And, uh, you know, they, they, the military industrial complex is very different. That's a, it's well, a, in a Russia, money and a, 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 a... Go ahead, because you probably so, formulated it better than I do. So. <laughs> what I would say in Russia, it's designed to defend the country. Yes. In the United States, it's designed to hire the country. To, yeah, to make it all go around economically. Right, right, yeah. yeah. right. Because if you, if you take out the military industrial complex, you won't have that Keynesian engine underneath it all. You could replace it. You could say, all right, you know, let's have uh, a general infrastructure. The, and of course, some uh, presidents have, have, have had precisely that idea. But once you have an institution or institutions that are, you know, what the, the Eisenhower speech, the famous speech that launched the notion of military industrial complex. Originally, the original draft had military industrial congressional conflicts. Right. And you could, you could add think tank, <laughs> you could <laughs> add a lot of other institutions because they all, uh, they all had with the, the existence, they all had a reason to exist. And once you have an institution 
that has people that preside over it and people that do the, uh, the whatever they do and with salaries etc it's almost impossible to get rid of that institution right. oh, and these right. institutions automatically get corrupted it's it's part of that's my study well, I just the corruption this of morning, institution the S&P for the year is down 8% Lockheed Martin's up 26% ah, yeah <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I don't know how we got on this uh, thing, but we need we have with the uh, the war on terror uh, as a part of the official reality. Already at that time, you could still be critical. You could still have some. Uh, there were, of course, quite a few. Uh, it's very interesting is to see how the. Uh, internet-based uh, uh, Sami's dot channels, uh, the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the various uh, common dreams and uh, truth out, and uh, you name it, a lot of these things that that uh, mushrooms uh, out of the internet uh, during the George W. Bush period. That <laughs> they changed today. They are. <laughs> cooperating with the CIA and the Democratic Party, of course, which has a completely different, a right. different thing than, than uh, at that time. And you see how uh, also those uh, institutions that were supposed to tell us the truth about everything get corrupted. Right. Well, they try and find an economic model and they fail to find an economic model that will support independence. I wonder, you know, to some extent, it's that it's also uh, they have they don't have the people who run them don't have enough intellectual depth and don't right. have enough historical knowledge to right. understand it right. as much as they should understand them. Right. right. Uh, and uh, oh, you see, I read this. I mean, I read the uh, and I read. The moment you see their giveaway, uh, their giveaway things. Every time I read somebody talk about Orwellian double speak, I know he hasn't read Orwell <laughs> <laughs> because it's new speak and it's double think. Uh -huh. And double speak has nothing to do with it. I mean, double, what is double speak? Lying, yeah, maybe, maybe. But I mean, so, but you know, then yeah. when you read that, you know that, that the person writing the article hasn't read Orwell. Yeah. And it would be good if he or she had read Orwell. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm drift off, but it's a, 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 an opportunity to do so for an audience so, that usually I, the la in recent, in, in, in the past two years, I've only been working in Dutch, no longer in English, which I used to do, of course. So, um, <laughs> so we, were, we were talking about the Missile Treaty, but so now we watch NATO being used to move east. Yes. So the Americans are using NATO and, and membership in NATO to try and encircle Russia and the land empire. Yes, the membership, well, they can't. You see, NATO's uh, rules, uh, according to NATO's rules, you can't apply for membership. You can be invited to join. Right. And there is a rule that you can only be invited if the security of the other members is not going to be negatively affected. Right. Effect. It has to be positively affected before you can actually uh, be accepted in NATO. Well, right. none of these things obviously <laughs> apply to uh, to uh, Ukraine. Right. And so, uh, I mean, this is in a very important point. I think uh, NATO and the UN, through its uh, subsidiary agencies like the WHO and uh, uh, a few others, um, don't follow their official rules. They are, what is happening is- It's what Lavrov said, the Americans are not agreement capable. Exactly. Right. Well, Lavrov, by the way, I think Lavrov is one of the greatest diplomats ever. I, and I think what's happening now is very much something that Lavrov and uh, Putin have worked out together with a very good security, uh, national security group of people that are now able, this is important, I think, 
they're able to get rid of the Atlanticists, at least part of them. Right. Because you have, you know, you have a mayor in Moscow, which has a problem, been a problem for, uh, for Putin. And you have a large group of people in the, in the capital, but also uh, in St. Petersburg, that, were, that still were dreaming of Atlanticist moves, that they wanted to be closer to Europe. And uh, Europe is called the goodies that they, you know, after, uh, after the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the nice things that people could buy were from the West. So well, you, the, had, it's, it's, you had a lot of people thinking right. that if we join them, we'd be fine. So what I've watched for 10 years now is Lavrov and the Russians consistently say, if you do these things, you will force us to oh, act. Of course, of course. And yeah. it's very interesting. Sir John Sawyer used to run MI6, gave yeah. a very interesting talk at the Oxford Union. I yeah, I saw that. Seen it. Yeah. 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 But he tells the story of, the, of Putin's story of the cornered rat. Right. And that's why my first, in, just looking at his body language, he says, oh, he's pleased. He thinks he's cornered the rat. So uh, I, I just thought that was a very interesting. But you, you see them clearly trying to poke the bear and poke the bear. And if you, I, I said to you earlier, the timing, you know, if you look at this, the, the tsunami of media coverage on the Russian invasion that, that hit immediately, that tells me this is, you know, that tsunami has been prepared for months and months and months. You know, both sides have been preparing for months and months and months. This is quite, it has a feeling of being quite prepared. Yes. Yeah. But I think that what, uh, what the people under Biden probably doesn't even think about, I mean, I don't know into what extent he can think about these things, but in the, uh, in the power vacuum that exists in the US, because Biden doesn't function as a president who is right. in the end accountable for, for what happens, for what the US is doing. So you have, of course, the neoconservatives, they're very important. You have uh, a number of other uh, entities. I think that uh, you also have a military that is not altogether with the neoconservative. Uh, but uh, you probably know more about that than, than I do, but I, you know, I really the, don't. It looks to me like the neocons and the intelligence agencies have tried to start this war. Well, what 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 apparently was happening, and this reached a when when Putin came out in December, early December, and say, okay, you know, let's do let's discuss a new security mutual security arrangements. So I'm with an ultimatum. I said you have to you have to sort of respond to this. This is what we cannot have. And that is, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, the NATO encroachment of, uh, of Russia and so on. And it was, it was uh, responded to by, uh, you know, it was it, it, as if it was a joke on the side of, you know, there's Putin again, he's got megalomania, he wants to extend, he, he, he dreams of restoring the Soviet Union type things. It's a, that was a response. At that time, it was clear that they were working on something and to, to try to get Putin to enter uh, uh, the Ukraine so that they could respond, they could tell the world, look, you see, we are always correct, right? So let's do something. Let's have a response. Whatever the response, I don't think they had worked it out, what the response would be. But then Putin does something very different from what they expected. First of all, he says there are two new sovereign states, the Lugansk and Donetsk. <clears throat> uh, I recognize them. We recognize them. They are uh, Russian speaking. They are, uh, they have, they themselves have declared themselves already separate from Ukraine. They did that soon after the coup d'etat in uh, 2014. And they have solidified that, that, this, that determination in 2015. And uh, I now recognize them as such. Before, right. when they asked, uh, hey, do with us the way uh, you, uh, you accepted uh, Crimea, uh, I, the, he didn't want to do this. He wanted to leave Ukraine intact and through the Minsk agreements that could have been possible if the Minsk agreements had been uh, followed. Had been, right. uh, and uh, the US stopped uh, 
the uh, Ukrainian regime from uh, uh, they, they sabotaged the uh, the Minsk agreement, so it didn't happen. Then, by having declared these areas as sovereign states, these sovereign states need to be protected because what was going on was a uh, an enhanced effort to what well, there were constant bombings of the of the Donetsk and Lugansk areas. And there have been for, for many quite years. Quite a while, yeah. Right. 14,000, and it's the figure that, 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 that everybody uses. And, but this is probably f much more than 14,000. And in the last months, this was intensified. Right. And you could expect a bloodbath. Any Russian uh, president would have to have done the same thing as what Putin did. No Russian president, the same as with the Crimea. If the Crimea had fallen into NATO hands, that would be as yes, Sebastopol as the most important port for the uh, Russian Navy, the only warm water port. So, it would have been inconceivable that it would have fallen in the hands of, right. of NATO. So anybody who is at the head of the Russian state has to respond to this and, and also to this, this more recent thing. So, well, but then Putin does. He goes in there not to occupy Ukraine. He doesn't want to occupy Ukraine. Right. What he wants to do is to uh, to uh, make it militarily, uh, uh, you know, not of not of a danger uh, uh, to the uh, to Russia. Uh, and he wants to, as he says, uh, he wants to denazify it, to take the Nazis out, the Azov people and a, a number of other Sloboda and other groups that have been uh, active and that have, of course, uh, probably had the most important uh, influence in the, uh, in the regime. So we see allegations uh, of uh, Ukrainian, the Ukraine government trying to get a hold of nuclear weapons. We see allegations of biowarfare labs. Do you know if any of this, uh, these allegations are meritorious or not, do you know? Of course, I mean sure. uh, we know we know. I I read about the uh, the biological war and chemical warfare uh, labs in Ukraine a long time ago. There were weird things that happening. There were they were genetically modifying mosquitoes. So and this this happened in Ukraine, and people right. were suddenly uh, being stung by weird uh, 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 weird insects. They were taking a bath or something, and uh, weird, and that could only be explained as something that would come from these uh, these labs. And we know that uh, the U.S. Uh, has uh, biological uh, uh, warfare labs all over the place, all over the world, yeah, uh, and uh, and especially in that area. So, uh, so can I just point out for, and this is for the audience, not for you. The last time the Russians tried to do something close to the American border was the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yes. And America took the position, you can't do this on our borders. We won't let you put first strike capacity right, right yeah. on our borders. Yeah. We won't permit that. Right. Yeah. Now, if Russia was doing bio warfare labs and these various things in Mexico. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, I dare say the U.S. would have invaded Mexico. You know, long ago. what you 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 mentioned a very interesting thing because here in the Netherlands, uh, the uh, what happened in uh, uh, 2014 uh, after the coup and uh, the referendum that uh, made it possible for the population of uh, uh, Crimea to not only uh, vote for independence from uh, Ukraine, but also to be reunited with. Uh, at that time, I read, of course, I, was, I, I followed it very closely, everything that happened, and I have a good archive uh, still uh, that I can consult. It's interesting, the commentary here and the commentary from Britain uh, is that Look, we no longer, it's no longer the time for spheres of influence. That's a, that's something of the past. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. You know, and these are, these are university professors who, who come up with this nonsense. 
As if, you know. No, they're if, paid to come up with no, this. Yeah, <laughs> well, you'd be amazed to what extent these people fool themselves. Really? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you don't underestimate the degree to which people can absolutely fool themselves. And then you think it must be coming from somewhere or they must be paid by. No, no, they just fool themselves. <laughs> oh, no. And it's, uh, it's amazing how to what extent they'll go fooling themselves so no, but imagine imagine that the russians said to cuba okay and and, and mexico or whatever we put gotta put your we gotta play around with some uh, uh satellites but no satellite or with with uh, rocket launchers and whatever but we don't do spheres of influence anymore. So Washington shouldn't respond to this. Right. No, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really that you read this. I read this in what used to be considered as intelligent newspapers, the so-called quality newspapers that I used to work for myself. And as a Handelsblatt was supposed to be the top quality newspaper in the Netherlands. There is nothing left of that. This is, by the way, something that few people are aware of that the media uh, no longer exists in the way that they, they used right. to exist. I was part of it. And in those days, uh, this was, I mean, a quarter century, I, uh, I did reporting from many parts of East Asia and uh, also a war and uh, insurgents and uh, rebellions, you name it, a lot of that kind of stuff. And <clears throat> it was possible, of course, it was sometimes haphazard the way in which these things were reported. It was sometimes, you know, not really all that honest. Absolutely. If people say right. that, it was never like, no, but it is wrong to say it was always thus, or it's never, that, that's not true. You didn't I, have to I know, parrot I know a, an a world, official reality. I know a world where your colleagues amongst yourselves, you didn't tolerate an, a colleague who was consistently wrong in, in his or her uh, assessments of things. Your, your reputation was based on your track record. And you, that means that you had to be extraordinarily careful. You, you couldn't afford to make a mistake. And that's why you, you know, you stick to what is observable, what is, what is, what, what is possible to, to, and yes, it's possible. And it happens in the US. It happens to some people I know who had sources and they thought, Hey, we can rely on those sources and they were used. This happened, of course. Right. And, uh, but what happened to that world? And this is something that people should realize. That world has disappeared because these media fell into the hands of a relatively small number of multi billionaires. Right. And these people, uh, these multi billionaires form an oligarchy. It's very much part of what we are going through now with Davos and the World Economic Forum and all this stuff. A lot of what has happened cannot be properly as assessed by many intellectuals uh, because uh, it has resulted from a power shift that's very important or several power shifts. One of them is the importance of NGOs. The right. NGO is totally unreliable the moment they are, because when they start out by idealistic people, they get hijacked. Okay. And people like Soros, of course, is a good example, and they get money. So they'll get the staff that earns a good living and they, they get well paid, these people on top of the NGOs. And these become, the NGOs become a, <coughs> a, a tool in the hands of, right. of, uh, They're kind of, hip of men. millionaires. So what we, what we have today with the, the, the World Economic Forum and Schwab and so on, is a uh, you know a coup that's what it comes down to by multi billionaires uh, with the help of NGOs. Without the NGOs, they couldn't do it. Without the uh, the media, the whole media power that serve not as uh, as messengers of uh, what is happening in the world, but they serve propagandistic purposes. Uh, without that, it wasn't. It has not been see, possible I, to. I to see do what that. you're describing. I see all that as a marketing front for the central bankers. Well, the central bankers, the central bankers, of course, they played an important role, but they weren't the. I mean, it's I think wrong to reduce it 
to it is always reductionism is always something that you have to be very careful of avoiding right. Right. because there are so many factors that go into it it's it's so difficult to trace and there's also inconsistencies in this this uh, right but so the the, the anything <coughs> for anything to endure like an NGO it's got to be financed so I always go back to you know, where's the money coming from and how is the money organized and does it flow? Oh, absolutely. Because, and, yeah. and you are, I wish, that, I wish you, we had a hotline so I can call you and say, listen. <laughs> that can be arranged. A, <laughs> <laughs> you, a, you probably have a, and I, but I, I also think that it is a problem and it's a, it's a trap to reduce things to one cause. Right, absolutely. There absolutely. are many causes. Right, right, right. It's like the weather, you know, we can't, <laughs> you can't really. It's a, that's why it's another interesting thing, because what, now this is something that is maybe go off the thing, but now we are talking at random, why not? Uh, I think that what the supranational uh, and, the, and the World Economic Forum and, uh, and Gates and, and co want to establish is a technocratic tyranny over yeah, yeah, yeah. humanity. We know that, right? Yeah. And it will fail. Why? I agree. Because what I've done is study uh, different uh, uh, systems of government in, uh, in East Asia. And of course, I mean, I am interested in the US and in, in European cases. And I separate uh, conceptually the idea of technocratic governance and political governance. And I have to hear, of course, it's not as it's not as clear and systematic as I make it appear, but I have to for you know for keeping intelligible. <laughs> technocratic governance starts from the premise that all the important questions have been asked. And we have to find the solutions. Uh, we have to we have to <laughs> we have to do things to uh, to deal, to cope with the problems that we know exist. Okay? That's technocratic governance. It's not possible because the, the, uh, I mean, the, 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 the real circumstances, the contingencies are so huge, so right. enormous. Once again, the weather. Right. Political, political governance for political governance, you have to t constantly rediscover the question, the important question. What is the problem? Uh, I, you know, if people ask me, give me an example. Well, in history, Bismarck is a good example. And today, the greatest discoverer of new questions is Putin. I think Putin is, Putin is an example of the most talented strategist. What Putin has done in the time since he took over from Yeltsin is beyond belief. How enormous. So I, and, I would say it's probably Putin and Lavrov. Is yes, a, it's course. like a coin. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right. And I, have, uh, I was uh, uh, one of my best friends died recently. He was a top diplomat in the Netherlands. And when the, the, the Netherlands had this you know, you, you have for, I don't know for how many years, you, you, you have a seat on the Security Council. He was there in New York and, and all this. And he told me, he regularly had dinner with Lavrov. And he told me how impressed he was with Lavrov as a person. As yeah. a person with, I mean, so I, I have this from and him. Lavrov, as a one, or, one or more of Lavrov's kids is still in the United States right now, mm -hmm. right? But he, I mean, as Lavrov, and there are many others. I think that, that, that Russia has got on at the top, and this is thanks to, uh, to Putin, because what, what he inherited from Yeltsin was beyond belief. All these oligarchs that had been robbing right. uh, Russia blind and all these, the, you know, the national assets, and that is how the oligarchs were created, of course, from, an, uh, from uh, this, this book. It tells it better than yeah, any I other. Yeah, I wrote down the name. This is, uh, this is really, it. it's, a, it's a, I mean, if you read every page of a book, then no, this is not good for you because, because, it, because it will take you many months to the get through. The tragedies for us, but, that uh, but it's a fantastic book. Uh, and it tells you that story very well. So I have on my list to ask you about the oligarchs because I'm watching this incredible collection of oligarchs in London, in the Ukraine, in Russia, 
you know, a lot of it networked from Russia to the Ukraine to Israel. So if yeah. you if you go Israel, Ukraine, yeah. Russia, London, yeah. New York, yeah. you've got this sea of oligarchs who are in all these yeah. places. Yeah. And I have to believe they're driving a lot of people crazy. Yes. And I look around <laughs> at the sanction, I wonder, you know, did both sides get together and decide, okay, let's help each other take out half of our oligarchs? Well, the, uh, the sanctions now, are the, the anti-Russian sanctions, are also taking care of these oligarchs that are in London. And, you know, they are, <laughs> and they are, uh, they are uh, stealing their well, yachts. And, they, and I don't think the Kremlin is really worried about that. No, no, I don't th I think the Kremlin is very happy. they are doing this. Well, so. but I'm wondering, I haven't, stu I haven't looked... If you look at how the rape of Russia occurred, you know, you had the Western intelligence forces and treasuries working with the Russian mafia to steal all this stuff. I I'm wondering if they're not just not cleaning out the baggage from that. In other words, they created these guys to steal everything, but now that that's over, they're ready to get rid of them. Yeah, pos possibly. I again, you know, when you see something happening, you think there must be a purpose behind it. It may be something that nobody had anticipated. Right. And you can't anticipate all these things. Right. Not possible. So I would be, I would, uh, you know, uh, argue against drawing too, too hastily conclusions. Oh, I don't, I'm... But I'm, I think, what, what yeah. I think is happening, and, and I think what, we haven't come to this, but for the first time in, well, since the beginning of 2020, yeah, two years, for the first time, I see some light on the horizon because of what has happened. So let's talk about that because we all need yeah. to see some light. Yeah. And if you see light, then there's, there's bound to be light. So I want to know more <laughs> about this. Well, the way in which Putin is moving extremely fast, uh -huh. the way in which the central bank, the Russian central bank, is now in a different position than it was. It was uh, for a long time very much in the, it, it was very much in the neoliberal Atlanticist yeah. thing, and it is out of it. It is, uh, he's listening to this well-known uh, Russian, uh, uh, Glazyev, uh, yeah. the Russian economist, uh, <coughs> who has always been critical of Putin for not moving fast enough on, on that score. And he has declared that Russia has to become self-sufficient. We no longer need the rest of the world. So what has he done? Well, he pushed very hard to do that starting yeah, in 2014. I know, I know, I know. And it's, it's, there are a lot of booby traps. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, okay, it can fail. But what he's done, he has taken on Davos. It's the first challenge to Davos. World Economic Forum, Gates, and So this and is what you see that I don't necessarily see. So tell us more about that. How is Putin he's taking He's using on? the sanctions. You know, because of the sanctions, right. he's created a new geo-economic system. Yes. And everybody thinks this is to the, to the disadvantage of, the, of, the, of, uh, of Russia. And to some extent, of course, that is, that is absolutely true. At the same time, he has reinstated the state. Right. And this is what, what is the World Economic Forum all about and Schwab all about, is to do away with the state. Right. And, you know, we have in a previous issue of uh, Gezond Verstand, we have uh, uh, a series of articles. Which one? This? That uh, go, uh, I'll, I will show it to you later on. A, a, a series of articles about the. Uh, 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 the, 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 the history before uh, the, the recent moves where you have the private sector ruling it over the public sector. Right. And I see this beginning on oh, a long time ago, of course. You'd have the MI, the Multilateral Agreement on Investments, and then that grows into, that fails because of the 9-11 thing. It's right. off, the, off the thing. Then we have the, the ideas of uh, the, the, IP, in the, the IPP and the IPCP, etc. And of course you right. have in, in uh, the US the, uh, the agreement with Mexico and, and Canada, etc. And all this is, 
is designed to give the to to start with agreements that will give the uh, uh, the the private sector a power over the governments over the public right, sector. So you use international treaties to ov out out Fox constitutional yes, government precisely, and right. of course. The most extreme form of this is what the World Economic Forum has always wanted to do, accomplish. Right. And this, what they, what they are after, the Great Reset, is precisely that. Not all of capitalism, because the medium, small and medium size in the, the things, they don't participate. It's only the very big ones, and of course the financial, uh, the financial uh, uh, entities. Now, this is what, and this is the disappearance of the state. Europe was an easy victim because the European member states of the European Union had already transferred lots of their sovereignty to Brussels. Right. They couldn't really do very much anymore. Right. So they were, and the European Union has turned out to be a monster, really a terrible thing with people like uh, Frans Timmermans who mentioned earlier and especially Ursula von der Leyen. It is beyond belief that a person like I mean, she failed as a minister of defense in Germany, but then when you fail there and you, you, they can give you a high with a top job in the, in the European Union, as long as you, you, uh, you know, obey the, uh, the instructions that we give you. So the European Union may well be the most dangerous thing for uh, Europe ever, if this all continues. Uh, when they, uh, on the 1st of July, they will sign something that will give all of us in Europe a um, digital idea. And that is, that, that is the same thing as what, what, what was talked about for a long time, uh, where you have, where it's, uh, it, it, it records the uh, injections you've had and lots of other right. things. And a, a budget, a, a CO2 budget, because if you, if you create too much CO2, you are really endangering the planet and, and all that nonsense. Uh, and it's also part of it. This is, uh, it's being signed on the 1st of July and probably they're going to make it operable in, uh, the, in the autumn. And then we have, <laughs> this is the newest thing, the WHO is going to be uh, the sole uh, authority over all the member states of the uh, the UN, everybody, all members of the UN, and, uh, and automatically then also the WHO must obey when the WHO says this is a pand pandemic and this is what you should be doing. And pandemic is not only the, the, the bio security thing, as, which right. has been, no, it's also the nature, it's everything. Right. And this means that Bill Gates is being given, <laughs> Bill Gates has become the world's greatest authority over everybody. Right. That's the, that is the design, whether right. it works, I mean, whether it's actually going to come about is of course another question, but it's well, beyond belief. Thing. Would Russia sign that? No, that's the whole point. Right. I'm now talking about Russia is the first challenge to all of this. Russia says it's the state. The, you see, we have, we have a problem with, uh, with a lot of thinkers in the West who, ha, who are of a, of a libertarian persuasion because they think that the state is the greatest evil ever invented over, and many people think so. But then you have, interestingly enough, you have a website, uh, Lee Rockwell, or you, you probably are yeah. familiar with it. These are people who come out of that, uh, that's, uh, and they are, to some extent, there are different varieties, of course, of libertarian. And they now realize how important the state is. Right. They've, they've all taken it for granted. Right. The state is the only thing that enables citizenship. You can't be a citizen of the European Union. You can't be a citizen of the world. That's just a wonderful uh, metaphor, but it is not real. Right. And you can only be a citizen of the state. So there is no democracy without a state. It's only possible in the context of a state. And <clears throat> this is what uh, Putin is reestablishing the state as the most important political entity with the responsibility of looking after its population. Right. And so the question then is, how will China and India support that? They are, until now, they are supportive. China, it's a very difficult 
uh, a very difficult thing because China in, people in Europe tend to, to think that this passport business this, uh, and this registering of everybody is like the social credit system in China. And to some extent, that is probably true. But I think that the Chinese system is a fundamentally different. It's not about control. It's about harmony. And the Chinese, and this is something that I also know because of my experience in Japan, the ultimate aim is harmony. The ultimate aim is well, it's to harmony avoid and risk management to my, to avoid disharmony, which is which is a reason for conflict. We right. don't want that. And the Chinese have this. It's very this Confucianist. It's a, you know it's many things in the Chinese uh, background, and you see that it of course it leaves you to some extent unfree. At the same it's very it, the spirit of it is very controlling. You know, it's yes and no. It's it, what I hear from people who live there and who describe how it works on the ground. It's not like what people uh, say. It's about nowhere it here. near as demonic not, as what I'm they're planning saying, here. I am not right, advocating no, I, it. I know, but uh, if the the what the what the West is planning is much more demonic. It has a different ultimate aim. Right. It's it's it is uh, you know it's the the unquestioned rule of a an, an 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 oligarchy above everything of multi yeah but one that's willing to in, literally invade your mind and your body yeah, absolutely right. I mean this has already of course happened right and there are people who have been injected with stuff that is so awful. And we, we, we haven't actually begun talking about this. This is the greatest crime ever, I think. I think the, the number of uh, victims, the number of deaths in the end are going to out, it's outnumber all the deaths in World War II. And it's happening right now under our very eyes. The people who are discovering this and who are making this uh, um, debatable subjects in the US, particularly are the insurance companies. Right. With the insurance companies, all of a sudden they have to, there's a 400% increase in life insurance payments. And, uh, right. and undertakers, they're saying, you know, we can't keep up with the dead bodies. So the, the one question I have is, will the government arrange, you know, they've put in place the system they need to keep it secret. Will they arrange a secret bailout of the insurance industry? Because the insurance industry, if if you look at how things are going right now, if that continues, they can't financially right. handle the yeah. the load. But in the U.S., you have a very interesting development. In the uh, I mean, the FBI, of course, can go all over the place, and they've just started a new division. Pick up anybody who. Uh, spreads uh, uh, fake news or whatever they call it. Uh, uh, but you have a central, a federal government that comes with mandates and uh, you have states uh, that say, oh, <laughs> it's not our mandate. Right. If you hear uh, the Santis talk and uh, if you tell, if you see him, the people, young people behind him, and the first thing he says is, you know, Take off those weird masks that you are, uh, uh, oh, you know. It's a DeSantis, <laughs> that's a great video. That's one of the top videos of the quarter on the Solar yeah, Report. Yeah. This, yeah. So, and it is, of course, it's unbelievable. You see the whole Biden crew always with these masks and, and also, of course, in Europe with Ursula von der Leyen with that mask. They are so silly. They look so unbelievably silly and they look so unbelievably obedient. Right. They're that's all being the goal. Ahead. Also, the ones that are participating, they're being hid. They don't realize what's happened to them. They don't realize that they have subjected, subjected themselves to a bunch of criminals. Uh, I'm assuming they're being very well paid to, you know, it's theater. Yes, but, you know, I, okay. Is it worth... I mean, is it is it worth making a fool of yourself? Well, not to you, you and me, but no. that's why we're here no, and no, they're there. Okay, no. <laughs> no, it's true. Okay. No, I mean, I often wonder, of course, what goes on in this, these heads. Perhaps very little goes on in these heads. I don't know. <laughs> but, 
But now back to, to Putin, what he's trying to do is establishing uh, Russia as a state. The central bank has to serve Russia. You, uh, you have, if you, in the Russian, of course, Russia is indebted to quite a few countries. All right. You no. Can, you can't collect in rubles. We we'll give you the rubles. Well, that's going to be very interesting to see yeah. how that plays out. But if you look at Russia's debt to GDP, so America's debt to GDP is 128 percent. Mm -hmm. Russia's debt to GDP is 18 percent. Yeah. After the rape, they yeah, never yeah, took yeah, the yeah, debt yeah. back yeah, of up. Course. I mean, yeah. that's the brilliance yeah. of what uh, of what happened because I was over in the Yukon in 2005 when the Russians sent one of their national security advisors to study the gold market. And that's, he went back and that's when they started to accumulate yeah, gold, yeah. but they never took the debt up. So they accumulated gold. They managed to do everything they've done, keeping the debt down. Mm -hmm. And they are not in a debt trap. No. That's the brilliance. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's a very unique thing to have a country not in a debt trap when they move to do this. But this is a contest between Davos and the Kremlin. This is uh, the first challenge to Davos. See, I, your framework is different challenge. than mine. Your framework is different than mine. Ah. And your framework is much more optimistic. So I want to stick with yours. Yeah, no, no, of course. <laughs> and I, I am aware. I am fully aware of, uh, I'm fully aware of the, the problems and of the ways that things can go wrong. But I try to, the first thing, that I try to, when I think that I've understood something, I try to find arguments or uh, things that go against it. I must understand what, what I may fail to see. And so that is the first thing you do. And that's what I'm doing every day now. I'm right. really, I, this is what I'm doing. And I see- Well, I've known you for two years and you've been doing it every day since I've known you, so. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, this is enormous. This changes. This, this, this changes really absolutely. changes the geoeconomics of the thing. And this so, is so I want to bring up something. A couple of years ago, we published a Solaria report called The Rise of the Asian Consumer, mm. where we looked at the phenomena. So you came back from Asia in approximately 1990, just as we began pouring money into the investment. I mean, we'd invested in Taiwan and Japan, but G7 really started to pour money into Asia and the South China Sea I came Syria. back in the late 90s. It's, uh, oh, I, I thought you I, came yeah. back in, okay. I came in the late 90s. So, yeah. so, so you began to see the rise. And, and now what we're watching is an enormous shift because instead of the world being controlled by the sea lanes and now the satellite lanes, we're watching the rise of the land empire and the Silk Road. And what I've been watching just as an investment advisor for the last couple of years, Wall Street has been taking public Russian companies that are going to basically, you know, their job is building out that land empire and Silk Road. And of course, the, the underwriters on sort of some of my favorite Russian companies are Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Morgan Stanley, <laughs> Goldman Sachs. Bam, the invasion starts. Who's in the market buying up Russian equities and Russian bonds? Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. Now, what I see is this is happening when that rise of the land empire is really about to take off. It's been happening. It's been percolating. But now it's really going to take off in a big way. And before it does, there's a repositioning. But, but I see the Western financial interests and tend to be on both sides of this thing. Well, they probably are, yeah. Yeah, and and so if you look at uh, a move for Russia, China, India to become much closer financially and emerge a multipolar world that builds the land empire, I see the city of London, I see the Western financial interests preparing to make big, big investments and profits on that, especially with all the money they've pulled out of the United States and the West. Yeah, it, as long as they're permitted to do so. They're permitted. I mean, they're doing. Well, no, I, 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 t I look at Japan, and I see that you know that Japan under the the American with with respect to foreign policy, etc. There's no question. But what Japan does locally has always been what Japan right. wanted to do, 
And if, uh, you know, if you, if they go along with, with market this and market that and financial this, and they make very sure, they make very sure that, uh, and then they bring the, the whole, it's interesting, the, Char, the Carlos Ghosn uh, mm -hmm. uh, scan, scandal, he was, he was right. But uh, the bring, they bring in somebody to repair a, a, company, a car company also as an example uh, to you know, reinvigorate uh, the Japanese industry. And they then put up with a, a lot of foreign stuff. But at some point, we stop it. And I think that the Russians... Uh, you see, there is, a, there, is other, there is another aspect to all this that uh, maybe I'm go, going off on a tangent now. Mm -mm. What you see, I have written about this quite a lot, and I, I've organized a few, uh, uh, a few conferences, also one at the University of Amsterdam. And that is about uh, the, the kind of things that the uh, Western economic uh, 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 wise people <laughs> could not see in what happened in Japan. Uh, the... Uh, The communists in uh, the, the Bolsheviks took over in the beginning of the 20th century in, uh, the, and created the Soviet Union. Took over from a Tsarist system that was still feudal, neo-feudal. Neo right. There was no clear separation between private and public. And of course the, uh, the communist command economies don't recognize the separation between private and public. So what had to happen when Yeltsin took over was a clear separation of private and public, but they couldn't do it. And that, that, then they had these oligarchs that started robbing the country blind again and, 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 you know, and moving their money to, uh, to the US and London and, and all that. What Putin now is doing, I think, is establishing clear separate private and public sectors. And I have seen the attempts in Japan to do that. In fact, I, uh, at one point, because I wrote about this, so people came to me and, uh, and one of them was the great grandson of a minister of finance in the, uh, in the uh, Meiji period that were, you know, when Japan mm -hmm. modernized and he was ordered by the, the government, which, which came to power through a coup also in, in Japan, <laughs> And he was ordered to establish a private sector. Oh. And, and this fellow, he, he, you know, he invited me for, for dinner, etc. And he came up with, with stories that had been in the family. Uh, he, of course, was far away in, 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 in the time scale, very, very far away. But they, they tried to establish a private sector. And what it meant, now, you can't have a public sector without a private sector and vice versa. Right. You can only have a feudal, a feudal system. And of course, in, in Western uh, history, you had a gradual, it took 200 years or something, with the growth of the bourgeoisie. Cities at first, and then with, you know, a lot, it's a very interesting story. And, and few people realize how important this is. Now here we have uh, in the West, because of the European Union and because of the growth of, uh, of the, the, the private sector power, over everything, uh -huh. uh, we have um, and the uh, the public private partnerships and the outsourcing. All this has helped erase the line between private and public. Right. And what Putin is doing is establishing a private public sector. Right. For the first time, Russia has never had that before. Right. And this is what I think is so very interesting. When it failed on the Yeltsin, as we know, and he he had to do it. I think. We're going to run. Are, are we in danger of Russia being the only location for both Christianity and capitalism? Well, now you are. <laughs> it's very interesting you say this because uh, because I, although I I have recently read somebody comment and said, well, you don't even have to be a Christian as long as you don't believe that there are more than two genders. <laughs> <laughs> That is another, of course, another very sore point for it. it's not only Christianity, it's culture in general. Right. right. And it's clear, it's clear that when, uh, when the Russians look at the, 
the unbelievable uh, deterioration of, of standards, of all manner of standards in, in Europe, in the West in general, that they want nothing of this. Right. But he is a Christian, a devout right. Christian, as far right. as I understand. Right. He was baptized in secret by his mother. His father would have lost his job if, he, if the father had known about this. He is always, he, uh, from what I, I read a, a, a bit on, you know, on Putin and uh, what, what his colleagues in the various phases of Putin's career said about him, that he really believes. Right. He's, uh, he is a genuine, uh, not, not somebody who does this as is often. The, well, I'm trying the, to remember, I think it was 2014, could have been later when he, I don't know if you remember his Christmas speech, when he kind of went off, I think it was at St. Petersburg, he went off on the immorality of the West. Yeah. And of course, half the audience is really uncomfortable because he's, <laughs> yeah, 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 he's yeah. bringing up all these things we don't talk yeah, about in polite yeah, society. Yeah, right, but, right, you know, right, yeah. you, you could see, I think, you know, I think when you function in those roles of responsibilities, you see how powerful culture is Absolutely. and how it can destroy a country. Absolutely. Right. And how the, uh, the upending of... Uh, of ideas, beliefs that were fundamental to a society like male and female, like um, what is marriage, what is uh, all these things. If you upend those, you prepare a society for uh, for accepting a lot of nonsense that was being well, pushed if, down their if, throats in the last two right, years. If words have no meaning, then you get the neocons. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So let's talk about the neocons. So. Um, what do the neocons do now? I mean, they've had free reign to destroy Syria, Libya, country after country. Now they're being uh, held accountable. Yeah, if, if Putin succeeds in doing what he is set out to do in Ukraine, then I think uh, it shows up that the neocons our power can't, can't do it. It will. It will certainly uh, place them in a, a very unfortunate light, and that is why it's also dangerous because there may be a last-minute attempt to uh, to achieve something that nobody at, at this moment can anticipate or will anticipate. Maybe in a, but you don't know in what form what form it will take. What I think. What I think will happen. Uh, is that uh, there will be an attempt to establish a government in exile with Zelensky right. uh, as the supposedly the head of state. And this will probably be in Poland. Uh, it, it is not, that's the only place where it can be. And so you have, you, have a counter, you have a counterinsurgency yes, force. Yes, insurgency in, uh, and they, you know, they have these, uh, uh, these mercenaries, the, 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 what is now called Academy and, uh, uh, oh, 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 so do you try and, and, the, the, and the, the bog, former Blackwater, do you the, try and bog the Russians down in the Ukraine forever? <clears throat> well, you know, it works with the insurgency. It's, uh, it's a, a, a nuisance, but, uh, it, uh, the, the Russians aren't there. It's the Ukrainians who have then uh, elected a different president who has sworn that he remains neutral. He's not going to uh, side with, uh, uh, with the uh, Atlantic, uh, uh, with the Atlanticists. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and so it will be, but my, my impression is that Putin doesn't want to have the Ukraine as a permanent uh, thing around his neck. What probably will happen is a partition, because when you look at the language uh, uh, map, you'll see that uh, the Donbass is very much, of course, a, a very independent-minded Russian-speaking, but then you have a large area that's Russian-speaking, and then you have an area that's mixed Russian as well as Ukrainian speaking. So Kiev is a very important part of the, I'm told, the Russian Orthodox tradition. Yes. yes. So do you keep the Kiev? The Kiev Rus, that is or uh, important. How do you relate? But the, but the distance between uh, Kiev and Donbass uh, is, is, is a little bit 
It's a little bit longer distance between Kiev and Donbass than it is between uh, uh, Kiev and uh, Lviv. Lviv. I don't right. know how, how to pronounce that. It's on the Polish border. Right. But it's a it's a huge distance. Yeah. So the question is, they the of course the, the new Ukraine must have a defendable border on the Polish well, side. Well, if you take Kiev down the river down to Crimea. Yeah. That's your eastern side, which is much more Russian than yes. the western side. Yes. But it probably won't be that clear. Right. And I don't know. I, can, I can't. I won't predict that, that kind of thing. I have no idea. But I think that there, there has to be a, a defend, there has to be a border that can be defended on the Polish side. And if the Poles want to start uh, making trouble inside Ukraine, it's going to cost them. So and, it seems uh, to me the polls have a problem because if you, and I don't trust the media on this, but according to the latest media reports, they have a million new citizens. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a, and of course we, we're getting them here, uh, and we don't know who they are, what they, what kind of things, what kind of people they are. Yeah, so we're sending the Nazis. They're Nazis. Right. Some of them we're are sending, Nazis. Yeah. Right. So we've seen that before with. Uh, when you get these huge wave of immigration, all the organized crime moves in. Yeah, so, that's right. So you have what's reported to be a million and a half. I mean, the, the announcement came several days ago that the EU would give three-year residency to any Ukrainian without a passport, which means, you know, what my friends tell me is, you know, everyone from many different countries is going to try and come if to it, the... If that, I mean, at the moment, Ursula von der Leyen, the head of the EU, imagine, the head of the EU, Ursula von der Leyen, it's beyond, beyond belief, not elected, <laughs> not shown any kind of, of merit or capacity to lead anything, leave alone the, the European Union. But it doesn't matter because the European Union is under, the, this is why I said earlier, if Putin succeeds in what he's trying to do, the US uh, will probably be happy, or at least part of the US will be very happy that the, the, the spell that, that uh, you know, was started by Fauci and, and uh, Gates and uh, Schwab, that the spell will break. That's important. I think much of the rest of the world, and we've already seen that uh, India and China, of course, isn't part of, uh, of the anti-Putin uh, league, and neither is Africa and uh, Latin America, and quite a lot of East Asia. The Japanese are in a funny position because they have to obey the US to a large extent right. for foreign policy purposes, but domestically, they have always gone their own way. And I know for a fact that, uh, that the top, the, the elites at the top, you know, they, they, uh, they don't, they, they are not part of this American thing. They, I talk, I talked to them, this is the recent, my recent years in Japan. And I haven't been there now for, for five years or so, but, but, but before then, I, uh, I was talking a lot about the relationship between the US and Japan. And I don't believe this is, uh, this is uh, carved in granite. I don't think so. No, it, well, it's very it, interesting. You know, I just finished uh, doing uh, re, re underwriting of a whole several dozen Japanese companies. You know, they've kept the West off of their boards. They don't let them in. Absolutely. Right. And this is important. And I think that maybe Russia has also understood that Japan's success after the Meiji period is uh, actually, uh, you're, fam you're familiar with the uh, import substitution industrialization. And that was the, the, the development uh, right. model that was also followed by the Philippines. Uh, uh, until the the new uh, uh, the new theories uh, uh, caught uh, you know caught on that no matter how poor no matter in what state of development countries must already belong to a global everything so they 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 will be reduced to subcontractor status right and <clears throat> what happened in the Philippines is that you know it it used to be the most promising country in East Asia. Right. I mean, only Japan was ahead of them. 
And I was there in the 60s for the first time. Huh? It's, uh, I saw it right. with my own eyes. It was prosperous. And although there was, of course, a great deal of poverty, poverty and then it changed right. because of this. Import substitution industrialization was done away with and uh, they became, became subcontractors. I've actually organized an, an, a conference on that story with the UN University in Tokyo and with people from the, from the Philippines and from Thailand, etc. I think this, this, this was my field. This was something that I was working on. And <clears throat> you see that uh, what happened in history was that Friedrich Liszt, he was a, a, a German who had a diplomatic position in the US. He was somewhere, he was, I, don't re, I don't remember exactly his function. And he saw the American, the American uh, method of, of industrialization. And he saw how this, and he, that was very protectionist. Right. And he told the Germans, that's how you do it. <laughs> and then he influenced the Japanese. The Japanese learned from Friedrich Liszt more than from anyone else. This is how you do it. And of course, the Japanese economic development is a wonderful uh, story. And I, at one point, I knew a lot of details. A lot of that has, of course, I have to go back to my uh, earlier writing to remember what I wrote about it in the... <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is what the established economists in uh, in the US and in Europe cannot talk about, cannot write about, because they're, um, they're not familiar with it, with this history. <laughs> economic... Well, but it's not part of the official economic story. Economic pseudoscience has, you know, has done away with history. That means the political, the political so I'm dimension to, has been removed from it. I'm going to have to interrupt you because there are a couple of things I want to go into before we close. So one is, it's March, mm. the Russians have invaded. Uh, we don't see where they halt, we, you know, we don't, but this can go in a variety of different ways. So they either achieve their goals in the Ukraine or they don't. Now, let's assume for a second, just for purposes of the conversation, they do achieve their goals this year in the Ukraine, given the tsunami, the Shriekometer has never been turned this high of vitriolic. And, you know, it's vitriolic on the Western side. On the Eastern side, they've just passed a new law and thrown all the media out of their country. Yeah, so the BBC, right. everybody is yeah. gone. Yeah. So you have this, um, this real antagonism how do we, how does, how does the West dial it back from here? Well, it's an interesting question. And of course, I've asked myself the same question. Uh, I've had discussions about it recently with people who work with me. And to go back to uh, what I mentioned earlier, there was a nuclear bomb, propaganda bomb uh, uh, released above the uh, At Atlantic Basin. And uh, the fallout and the radiation has affected seemingly everyone. I mean, the the uh, the orchestra say Sergey can no longer uh, uh, conduct here, and uh, Russian sopranos who don't distanciate themselves from uh, from Putin can no longer sing for the Metro Metropolitan Opera. You have ministers in the Netherlands that order their churches to ring bells in, uh, to, in, in sympathy with Ukraine and go on and on and on like this. They're crazy. I mean, this is insanity. But I think that the anti-Russia, the anti-Putin um, understand the anti-Putin, what do you call it, hysteria? Now, the anti-Putin dogma well, he, so will stay with the top. But, but ordinary people underneath, this is, you know, do you remember anybody who gets worked up about the, the, uh, the, the Iraqi uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction? Well, but here's the thing, the, the, as these events wind through, look, I'll just speak for America. The average American is facing the loss of subsidy in other words, the American consumer was a spoiled creature yes. at the center of the earth. Yeah. As they lose the benefits of that right. subsidy of the reserve yep. currency and these yep. other things, 
as you know the the whether they lose it because it's eroding or they lose it because the oligarchs get all of it or the billionaires get all of it you know what is happening is putin is the scapegoat so so the fed is you know the fed's creation of you know fantastic increases in the money supply is not causing inflation mm -hmm. it's putin who's causing right. inflation right. so it's a very convenient scapegoat yes. for everyone yes how long does this last in the u.s in uh in europe i i think that we must look at germany um Schulz has sort of said, okay, we, we're not going to, uh, you know, the Nord Stream 2, we're not going to make, he hasn't said it's forever gone. He's just right. said, He's, he said, know, we're not certifying, but. So, uh, German industry is going to find ways to open that faucet, that spigot or whatever you call it. And, uh, they have to, it, or they're it, going down. Exactly. The German elite won't have a, a pleasant life if German industry goes under. Right. German industry cannot allow to go under. And German industry will go under if Schwab has his way. And German industry will go under if they remain hostile towards uh, the Russian Federation. Well, that's why, to me... So, you see, I think you'll see a change in Europe. And then the German example may have an effect in the rest of Europe. I mean, right now it looks like Germany's committing suicide. Yeah, it's committing suicide. Yeah, of course, as many people have, have, have noticed. And it's not only the Nord Stream 2. Right. It's the whole, there's the crazy idea of going to a zero emission of, uh, human emission of CO2 uh, uh, by uh, 2030, and then you know it's it's so crazy, it's it's beyond belief that that intelligent people go for this nonsense. The human, the human you know, who started this is Maurice Strong. Well, he was was yeah. one of the one of the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, uh, he was an adoptee, uh, intellectual adoptee by the Rockefellers. If you if you look, and I want to study it more, but if you look at what they're proposing. It's really a way of shrinking access to resources by the retail and preserving it for the top and the corporations. It's what it looks like to me. Yeah, it's, it's, but you can't, you know, you, you cannot have a prosperous Germany that is comfortable for the elites unless you have German industry. Right. And the same goes for the rest right. of Europe. I, 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 and this will, and they will see this, they will know this. And this, the, you see, okay, well, here I live in the countryside. And if you go to Amsterdam, they're all crazy. They're all, you know, they, you can't talk with them about any of the stuff that we have discussed now, especially the, the this is something that I noticed with, we haven't talked about my uh, my. Uh, and I want yet. to, that's on the list. But, uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's the, it's the higher educated people who will only write for us under a pseudonym. They can't afford to write on their own name because they can't afford to deviate from the prescribed reality. They can't. But the people around here, this is a polar, this is meadows around me. We, have, we don't see the cows now. Oh, but, I, I didn't mean, realize it's, this is a but, polar. You know, and it's, it's, it's the people around here, they don't believe all this stuff. Okay, so for the American <laughs> audience, I just have to stop and you have to explain what a polar is. <laughs> uh, Dutch polar is uh, it's it's what used to be uh, water ocean. or yeah. <laughs> or morass uh, a swamp. Uh, it's it made dry and uh, it's uh, land built out it's of land, the water. It's, it's land extracted from uh, from water or a swamp. Yeah, and so uh, it's the uh, well, it's the pride of the Netherlands and. Uh, we have fantastic cows and, uh, and lambs and everything. Well, if you look, if you look at the profits of the Dutch Empire, it was basically reinvested to double your landmass. Of course, the Dutch Empire was a seagoing empire. Yeah, and the uh, and uh, that was the the pride of the Netherlands. Yeah, and uh, they, they were in the business of uh, exploitation of lots of the rest of the world. Right, and competing with the Brits. Yeah, of course. At some point, the Brits, the Brits <laughs> took over, 
And yeah. that was when, uh, when, uh, 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 the East Indies no, versus it's the, the Dutch act of navigation by, yeah. uh, by, um, what's his name? Famous, famous uh, political figure in, uh, I mean, my memory, this is the problem, you know, I can, I, <laughs> when you are, I'm now, 18, you know, oh, no, you know, too next much. month, I'll be 81. You know, too and much. I, I, I forget these names, but, uh, but he passed the act of navigation. And what did it say? It says all goods brought into Britain and taken out of Britain may only be brought into and taken out of Britain on British ships. British right. boat. And that was right. the end of the Dutch seafaring empire. Right. Okay. Cromwell. 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 It was Cromwell. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, two things. We see the WHO Treaty being negotiated. We see the EU moving to do the digital ID. So while everybody's distracted watching the Ukraine, we see very quietly a huge move for digital control and the digital control grid. You know, I always say it's turning our homes into digital concentration camps. And it's being done very quietly because it was running into huge opposition. The, the passports running into huge opposition. Now it's being done very quietly, stealth, to pop out later this summer. Right. What do we do? How do we stop it? I think that people who have their QR code on their phones, I must throw them right. off their phones. Right. Uh, they have to, but how do you, how do you get them to do this if they don't see the, the, uh, the slavery that is ahead of them if they don't? Uh, yeah, it's m massive civil disobedience is necessary, but it was necessary for qu quite a while now. And it is, right. we are trying to, to encourage it, even though, I mean, I'm not an activist in that way in organizing things like this, but I am in the business of telling them, of, of, of giving them the, uh, of reporting to them what is happening, what is, what is, uh, visible, what is factual what is happening. But uh, uh, they're close, they're close in, in, and especially, as I mentioned earlier, especially within the European Union, they are not, the, 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 the Netherlands is not a sovereign, so, but, independent country But if anymore. you look at the WHO treaty, if Russia doesn't come in, and some of these other countries that are giving them a financial backdoor don't come in, could that, could that bust it? I know if, if you see, if, if the Russian example that the state has to be reinstated as the most important enti political entity, if you want to have a citizenship, if you want to have democracy, if you want to have a prosperous right. life, you go, I mean, you, if you want to continue with the European Union, you have to follow the goals notion of uh, the, uh, uh, that, uh, the Europe of the nations. That means a real, real federation where the, the various members will agree or disagree with different, uh, no, different propo policy proposals and participate with this and not with something else. Uh, and that is the, I think the only way in which it will work. Otherwise it will be, uh, you will give up, uh, the, uh, the citizenship. That's it. Right. Citizenship is, you're, is, you're, is what, and many people well, you'll get don't tax know what it is. You'll get taxation with no representation. Exactly. So, um, so every week I do a, a, a wrap up of what's going on called Money and Markets with a fellow named John Titus, who wrote our, I brought you this, our CBDC. Yeah. So John wrote the CBDC um, analysis. And uh, he refers to Klaus Schwab he picked out Fauci, Schwab, Gates, and Soros, and he calls them chew toys. And a chew toy is like those rubber bones yeah, that you yeah, give yeah. a dog. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. And he says, he predicts that Schwab, Fauci, Gates, and Soros are going to be the chew toys. They'll be thrown to the crowd to eat. Now, even if that's only, uh, you know, a, a bone to the dog, I, for one, would love to see Klaus Schwab thrown to the crowd to be a chew toy. <laughs> and, but, but I find Schwab to be, first of all, whenever I look at him, he, he so reminds me of Blofeld from the yeah. Spectre yeah, yeah. that I can't not laugh. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, 
I'm watching behavior that makes no sense to me. So let me give you an example. Occasionally, I will write a letter to the editor kind of thing. So I watched a video of Schwab speaking at the Boston CEO Club, introduced by the chairman of Bain Capital. So here's a guy who's promoting the end of personal and family wealth, being introduced by the chairman of Bain Capital, who was so obsequious it was embarrassing. Mm -hmm. So I decided, okay, I'm going to write a letter to the investor relations department at Bain Capital and ask them whether or not Bain Capital, as a matter of policy, believes in the end of family and personal wealth. Yeah. <laughs> of course, I didn't get a reply, no. but now I'll, I'll publish the letter. Right before then, uh, Davos does this series of lectures you know, during their meeting with Yellen, the Secretary of the Treasury, getting on, again, totally obsequious and unctions toward Schwab. So here's the, the person responsible for the Treasury market, basically, you know, sort of acting in hero worship of somebody who's proposing, again, the end of personal wealth and capitalism. And you think, what? Do, 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 do words have no meaning to any of these people? Well, then Vandalayan gets on and gives a speech that was the weirdest thing I've ever, I couldn't finish it. It was so unlike the, the person who, be, you know, if you look at her first week as the head of the ECB, she struck you as human. This was beyond strange. Mm -hmm. So you think, what, you know, who is this guy? Is he? Schwab? Yeah, I mean, he's. I, is a, I, I, uh, I met him once in Singapore. I, there was a World Economic Forum uh, Asia edition, and uh, I was invited to talk about Japan. And I went against the grain of the Japanese uh, uh, detachment of our business, top businessmen, after which I became friends with them. You know, that's how it works in Japan. <laughs> and, uh, but I saw Schwab, I was, I, I mean, he, he asked me about uh, Japan, etc. And then a biggie arrived and he just got up and left. And, you know, he just, but at dinner, it was Lee Kuan Yew was uh, still alive and Lee Kuan Yew was no longer the president. You know, he made Singapore, as you know. I Lee have Kuan all Yew, the biographies of him. It's yeah, one Lee, of Kuan Yew, Lee Kuan Yew was a very interesting character, of course, and, but he was then chief minister, etc. If you saw at dinner the behavior of Schwab with Lee Kuan Yew, well, he didn't actually go on his knees and, and, and worship him with, uh, he, but the next best thing. It was unbelievable what a show that was. So that's my, my, uh, my direct experience of Schwab. He has been, you know, he's, he is tickled pink every time he sees a royal pass with Prince Charles and our queen is our queen, I say, but you know, the, the, and my thing, my impression is that the king isn't exactly all too, uh, too happy about this, but, uh, he is a collector of uh, connect of of royalty is fine, fame is fine, and what he does is he has the best network. This is it, you know. He this is uh, the best of the the young global leaders, and when you go back to the names of the young global leaders, that was uh, Macron and uh, uh, Merkel. Trudeau and so on. Interesting that Zelensky has said that he, he Zelensky, who is going to mm -hmm. run the, the 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 government in in exile for for Ukraine, he patterned himself after Trudeau. Trudeau was his great uh, uh, model, his great example. You see pictures with him where they are, uh, and he is the is a very interesting thing because here you have it worked out. Uh, some people say, but, you know, Schwab has said that Putin was a member of the young global leaders. And this is very important to, to make this distinction. The young global leaders undergo a testing period. Putin probably, when the, when the World Economic Forum came up with this new thing, young global leaders, he wanted to sniff at it. He wanted to see what, what, right. what was going on, because Putin has to be informed. So he, uh, he, he said, I'm going to have a look at what you guys are doing. And so Schwab can say, hey, he was a, no. What happens is that the young global leaders, 
uh, we have a nice cartoon in one of our issues uh, about this. They can be accepted if they are amenable to the theory, but you know, it's a sort of a, a weird uh, 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 ideology that uh, the Schwab uh, works with. And uh, he, uh, people who accept this and people who are easily influenced are accepted. Right. So that includes Macron. It right. includes a lot of people, Merkel, a lot of people have gone and in people and with their own opinions in. out. Right. And Putin is an example of that. So you have Putin, he's out, but uh, Zelensky is in. Yeah. Wonderful. We have, right. we have the Kremlin. Ma many versus... people, many people have been cycled initially into things like that. Now I don't think it means a lot. No, it means very little. Right. Right. But the people who stay in and who influence, like, uh, I mean, Trudeau is a very good example, and uh, Cynthia Freeland, who underneath him is probably even more important. They're all uh, World Economic Forum. So uh, when I was in Washington, we used to call those guys poodles. Nobody took them seriously. Mm. And, um, you know, although their positions had some power, but everybody knew they were just poodles. And I think it's taken the world a while you know, this is the beauty of the truck convoys. It's taken the world a while to really believe that the poodles are as bad and, as they are. But once the world cottons to the fact that the plan is as crazy as it is and the poodles are as bad as they are, you know, then we see a shift. And yeah. I think it's one of the reasons the narrative is shifting from, yes. from COVID to war because <laughs> once the general population gets it in their head, that the leadership is incompetent, you know, then it's a new world. Yeah. And I think that's one way or another, that's part of what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. So, okay, next three months, you're doing this. How are you gonna have fun? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I tell you that uh, with this recent development in Ukraine, I felt, in my element. I mean, I was, uh, I got up at uh, two in the morning. Uh -huh. I had to have the latest and five minutes before the, uh, the, the thing had to go to the printer. <laughs> I finished 3,300 words and it was at first two, I had to it's take It's like out being things. 25 and back oh, in Tokyo. No, but it has to be, it has to be, <laughs> yeah. of, of course. And uh, uh, I, I enjoy it, but I'm also very tired. Mm -hmm. Maybe you notice. And, uh, yeah, you look great. Uh, yeah, I know. But uh, I, I, <laughs> I was, and, and then after that, I did various uh, uh, uh -huh. brief uh, videos and update of what is happening there. And we got uh, between four and six hundred new subscribers because of those videos. Yeah. So that's uh, it works because you know I need more subscribers. Well, but also your insight and your analysis, I think, is very. We have about thirty thousand people reading it. Yeah, that's about half of those uh, you'd say are subscribers, but it's read by more than one person. So you know, at the beginning of the year, we published an interview with Wim Hof. So uh, and it's about his new book, The Wim Hof Method. Are you familiar with the Wim Hof Method? No. If you're going to keep doing this, you may we may want to turn you on to the. We're going to send him a copy of the Dutch Wim Hof method. So, do you know who Wim Hof is? No. The Ice Man. Oh yeah. Oh, the ice oh man. yeah. Of course. No. Yeah, but you know, I. Yeah, okay. It's a, It's one of those. Can I tell you something? Yeah. I've been doing it. I have, we have a colleague who runs our future science series yeah. and she's been studying and doing Wim Hof for years and has tried to talk me into it. And then last year I had a boating accident. It really knocked my health. And I thought, okay, I need to be radical. And I said, well, he's always right. I'll try Wim Hof. And you know something? It's fantastic. But if I did it, I'd probably end up in bed with a, with a, <laughs> with a bad cold. And in fact, <laughs> I have one coming up now. I can feel it in my throat. Oh no. Oh, Absolutely. No. So I should stop talking. No, 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 no. I mean, you haven't <laughs> asked me about the magazine. That's the most important thing. <laughs> I love, well, first of all, I always love your covers. Your covers always yeah. make me laugh. Yeah. And this one of Schwab, I have to hold it into the camera. All right. Yeah. How you're going to, you're going to like the next one. Oh, really? The next one is Alexander Nevsky. You know, in every Russian city, you have a Nevsky prospect, right? Yeah. He's a great hero. Alexander Nevsky, and it's one of the greatest films ever. Eisenstein film, Alexander Nevsky with music by Prokofiev. It's just what magnificent. Is what is it? 
Alexander Nevsky, and okay. he defeated the Teutons and Crusaders who came to conquer well, Russia. Yeah. And uh, the, the Teutons, of course, the Germans, the Teuton Knights, uh -huh. and uh, uh, the very famous film that was an example for many Hollywood directors. I mean, anybody who knows film will know. What's it called? Alexander Nevsky. That's called I want to. Alexander does, Nevsky. And the music is Prokofiev. Prokofiev. It's a magnificent piece of music. Uh -huh. And uh, of course, in those days, uh, there were no sound movies, so they they had a, a symphony orchestra and a choir. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, the, it's fantastic. Okay. And it's a cover is Alexander Nevsky. And any Russian who sees this knows where our sympathies lie. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this <laughs> wonderful interview. Before we close, anything else that you want to add? Well, you see, the, the it's interesting to see that um, there were, uh, when this began in, well, two years ago, basically. It's March? Yeah. Two years ago, on the 11th of March, was the official uh, uh, pandemic announcement and you decided I had with with a friend with a friend with whom I sometimes did uh, you know uh -huh. a video things we had we were the first to talk to discuss it and on the 5th of uh, uh, April I did the first uh, uh, solo thing for uh, for one of those uh, video uh, yeah. channels uh, where I said, this is not a real pandemic, this is uh, manufactured and this is, uh, etc. This is put together with lies. And then I continued doing this, but I was with uh, another friend who, had a, who has a similar uh, video channel. And I said, look, Tom, uh, we, we, we can do all this, but it doesn't, it, it fly, it's, it's in cyberspace, it gets right. all diluted in cyberspace. We need, we need, to make we our need something on paper. And I uh, and then uh, uh, soon after that, uh, a friend, an old friend of mine, uh, with whom I done the 9/11 uh, thing, uh -huh. uh, he visited me, and after we uh, had exchanged pleasantries, he said, "Carl, what we should do? We should have a weekly." Now I hadn't thought in terms of weeklies because, but I said, "Okay, let's do that." And we have a bi-weekly, and what it does it reports on things that are important for uh, for the Dutch community and more than the Dutch community, obviously, and for our future, and that are either not reported on by the mainstream media or very distorted by the mainstream media. That is the... the uh, so we don't write about things that the mainstream media do report on. Uh, which, if it's reliable nowadays, it's only I think only the cooking uh, sex. Uh, anyway, the uh, the <coughs> or the, not even that because borscht is now out, of course. Well, but the interesting but, thing about you but, writing this, you have. Uh... But we had we, we this was the end of June and the end of September. We had the first issue. Yeah, I remember. I saw it. And uh, we had no idea that it would become as popular as it did. Because there is clearly, an, but we are nowhere close to reaching the people who should read it, because they're all, uh, they've all been, uh, they've heard about this is a conspiracy theory rag, and conspiracy theory. This is the most single, the single most successful psyop detail of the CIA, well, the conspiracy what I, theory. What I find, and it takes time and it takes patience, is that these things develop and move virally yeah and people are hungry and the the beauty of what you write is you just have significant depth that is very rare and that's what people want that's what they need yeah i think they uh, uh they see they also it's reporting it's right. not an opinion magazine right. there is some some the, some writers sit back a little bit and they draw some, you know, this hypothesis, but it's very clearly the hypothesis is based 
an observable reality. It's an absolute, I don't go into areas where some people say, you must do this, you must do that. No, because I can't do any reporting on it. I can't right. observe it. Right. And uh, uh, it's reporting and as I mentioned earlier, your track record as a reporter depends on, uh, on I mean, your reputation determines on your track record. You can't well, be you're wrong. Well, you're giving me plenty of incentive to improve my Dutch. <laughs> 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 okay. Thank you for joining us on the Solaire Report. Uh, thank you, Catherine. It was wonderful and talking with you. I promise so, you will come to Stavor and go sailing with us. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't know that was uh, oh, a yeah. possible offer, but yeah. sailing, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. May? Oh. May is the best month? Wonderful. Okay. Okay. You'll see me. Have a great day. Thank you. Same to you. Bye. Bye.